So the next session is actually is called Websites, Social Media, and Newsletters, Tips and Tricks of the Trade. Thought it'd be good for a refresher. Um, we've had in the past, it's been quite a few years, um, probably about seven or eight years since we had someone in Alex's position come to our conference and um, talk a little bit about your websites, Facebook, any of those digital media that you use. And, you know, just a refresher course on, on what's some good practices. And then Amanda is going to talk about, because she's the editor of our seniority report, um, which hopefully you just saw the newest issue. Um, she's going to talk about newsletters. It's another refresher. We do this occasionally. And um, really tips and tricks of the trade as well. So I want to introduce Alex King. He's the director of digital media strategy, digital strategy for Benebrith International. And a fun tip or fact about Alex, um, actually there's two, because his mother serves on the board at Queens Benebrith. Um, and also Alex started the week before the pandemic started. Uh, with all the shutdowns. So he learned quickly um, his job was very important to Benebrith International. So we'll go ahead and start with Alex and um, take it away, Alex. Thank you, Janelle. I really appreciate it. Um, I did indeed start the week before COVID. So things really did change for me quite quickly. Um, and uh, I think even as we go into, I mean, I guess year three of, of sort of, you know, we're kind of a pandemic a little bit, but not completely. And, um, you know, I think being, having, you know, a good social media presence and sort of learn, you know, having some good tips and tricks in your back pocket is, is even more useful now. So um, I'm just gonna share um, presentation. Let me know if you can see it. Um, sometimes I've had trouble sharing, but- um, Oh, we can see it. Okay, great. Good. Um, so, uh, so I'm just going to be talking about some, um, you know, some best practices, websites, social media, newsletters, um, like Janelle said, uh, tips and tricks uh, of the trade. Um, but the first thing, I, the first thing I want to say is that um, I can send this to anyone. You know, I I, um, I put this together, and uh, anyone who wants a copy of this, I'll, I'll send it to Janelle, and, and anyone can. Um, can have it at the end. So um, with that, I'll, I'll get started. So the first thing um, that I want to talk about is, is websites. Um, I think a lot of the time, you know, people see a website as sort of more of a formality and you want to you know, convey your information, but it's not necessarily looking up to date. And, you know, you don't have to have the sleekest website with, you know, the coolest transitions, but I think at the end of the day, you want it to be, I, I personally think that the most appealing and easiest to digest websites and where the information is easiest to digest is something with a pretty clean design and, and clear messaging. And you don't want to have to have someone go more than like two clicks to find the information that they want. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it does, it does depend on your resources, of course, um, because a, a decent website does cost some money to create, but definitely things that you can do within what you have now. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of where we can start off. And, you know, then I guess you can sort of, you know, um, depending where you are, depending what your resources are, kind of go from there. Um, now, like I said, navigation is key. Two clicks, maybe three, and you want to be where you where you want to go. For example, um, you know, uh, if, if a resident wants to, uh, or so a pr prospective resident wants to apply, or a call or, or, you know, have some information, it should be, you know, a phone number and email should be at the footer. Or, you know, if there's some type of form, you want it to be one click away, um, you, know, you know, on a drop down menu or on a sidebar or something like that. Um, I, I always like, um, and we, Benebrith actually has just um, gotten a new website as well in the last three or four months. Um, one of the things that I pushed for was having a very easy way to have a um, gather information. So I like the uh, the ability to get email addresses because that way you can reach more people. You grow your subscriber base um, with, uh, with newsletters, which I'll get to in a little while. But um, the other thing I want to say is, which has happened to several websites that I've dealt with, is that 
you don't want to let it become a filing cabinet. And all that is, is all I'm saying there is just don't, you don't need to put every bit of information or every bit of news that, that, you know, that kind of comes your way that, you know, is, is um, that mentions you or anything like that. Um, and the last thing I'll say about websites is that you want to include if, if possible, um, high resolution visuals, because like, you know, people, people have shorter attention spans now and, and big, nice looking images give the website a, be a better aesthetic. Um, videos, I would say are less important, but they do add some, they do add like another dimension. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, it can be embedded in your website. It doesn't have to be, um, I mean, it can be from, from YouTube. It doesn't have to be in your website. Um, sometimes those things affect loading times and, and um, you know, that no, it doesn't need be complicated it's just you know one of those things where you want to um make sure that people see your site and aren't like oh that's like that looks like it's from 2002 like they, they you know you want people to see you know images and and when i get to videos in a second um you want to have i think it's important to have like testimonials and or you know res current residents um i think that's really important um so with that i'll get to um social media so um, I'll get to the videos in a second, but um, the most important thing I think to start off is that you want to know your audience and what platforms make the most sense. And for me, I think looking at, um, you know, the demographics that you all are looking to, uh, Facebook is a must. I know it, I know that it has its issues and, and, you know, there are lots of things to be said about Facebook, but I think it's important almost as, um, uh, almost as like a second hub, almost as a, um, where you could send someone to Facebook, your Facebook page instead of your website, because you obviously want to link to your website from, from your Facebook page. Um, I, I know there's many businesses that forego even having a website and just have, um, a Facebook page. I don't necessarily recommend that, but that is something that a lot of businesses and, and, um, I, I'm not so sure about, um, living facilities, but, but many businesses do do that. And YouTube is, I, I think of it as social media. I know some people, it's sort of like a gray area, but um, it's great to be able to point people to a YouTube channel. It doesn't matter how many subscribers you have. You, you, you know, it's always great to grow subscribers and it's sometimes difficult, sometimes not, um, depending on how much time and uh, like, like I said, resources you have. Um, but according to Pew, uh, you know, adults, 65 and over 49% use YouTube. And I'm sure that numbers is growing um, as we become a more online society. So um, I, the other thing I'll say about social media is that Instagram is probably a good way to go. And I'll, I'll get to that reason in a second. Um, TikTok is, is one of those things I put on there that I, I'm not so sure you need to worry about that. I just put it there because it is so relevant right now. And if, if there's someone maybe who's very uh, social media savvy or has some time, uh, you know, delving into just seeing what's, you know, what, what TikTok looks like, it might not be a bad idea, but that that's more of kind of an outlier. Um, like I said, Facebook's a must. Um, testimonials are the best type of, of videos, I think, to post um, on your website and on YouTube. Um, that shouldn't be the only thing you post, but I think basically highlighting a good resident experience, a positive residential experience is one that there's no replacement for that. So, um, and, and, that's, and that's the same reason why I said Instagram and, and TikTok are good, particularly Instagram, because I think um, that kind of reaches the, the demographic of people who are also involved in the, in the decision-making processes of um, when people maybe you know, older adults want to go into a, um, uh, one of our living facilities. You know, they, their, their children may be, you know, probably are millennials of some age or, you know, depending, maybe, maybe a little bit older, younger, um, but they are most likely on these platforms. And the best way to engage and, and make, you know, appeal to, to older adults is, also, is to also appeal to the people who are helping them make the decisions. Um, so, that that's the reason why I say that Instagram and TikTok are important. Uh, um, Instagram is also becoming less visual, less um, photo heavy, and more video heavy, um, and that's you know sort of it's sort of playing a similar role as TikTok, and that's why I said TikTok is not necessarily super important. Um, 
I know, I know what I'm saying may sound kind of a little out there or, you know, it, I'll, I'll definitely, there'll definitely be a, a couple of minutes for questions. So um, feel free to, to do so then. Um, the question that I, I anticipate getting um, is how often to post. I would say three to four times per week is at most is, is plenty. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it just kind of depends on, on the engagement that you've had in the past. Um, you also want to monitor engagement. There are social media tools that you can use, um, free ones like Google Analytics. Um, you want to monitor trends. I, I didn't mention, when I say trends, people often think of Twitter. I didn't mention Twitter because I don't think that, I don't really think that Twitter is, is, is relevant. Um, it, it's one of those things where um, you, you kind of just have to, you know, maybe maybe you you already have a Twitter account and, and you want to grow your followers. That's great. I, I just don't think it's necessary. Um, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. And um, I, as I said before, you want to keep in mind that you want to highlight positive resident, ex resident experiences. And um, it's sometimes, you know, you always want to keep in mind the business aspect, but I'm sure it's, I don't need to tell you that. So um, the last thing we'll, I'll talk about is um, newsletters. The number one thing is that subject lines matter. They really do matter. I know like in terms of, of what I gravitate towards too, if, if it could be from someone that I, you know, a, a source that I really like, if the subject line isn't great, I'm not going to open the, the newsletter. I'm just not, maybe I'm an outlier. I'm not sure, but they really do matter. And they, you really want to keep them short and sweet. That, that's um, if, if it's like a whole long sentence, people will skip right by that. And unfortunate, that's, that's just kind of unfortunate. And Maybe they'll open it, but the, once you open the newsletter, you want people to click through. through. That's where a lot of people run, a, a lot of um, organizations, and and um, and that's where a lot of organizations run into trouble. Is they, you know, they get a lot of high open rate, but a low click rate, and you know, you want people to be engaging once you know once they they open your newsletter. You don't want to just you know have them open it and be like, oh, okay, and then forget about it. You want them to click and get to your website or get to a video that you posted or something like that. Um, the uh, optimization for mobile devices is, is extremely important. Um, that's, I think it, it kind of speaks for itself, but whatever you decide, whatever platform you're using or choose to use in the future, it, it's important. It's extremely important that it's optimized for phones and tablets because that's where a growing number of people are going, are using um, to, to open these emails. And A-B testing, that's a little bit out there too. Um, it basically sends a test to a certain number, a certain percentage of your uh, subscriber base, your the different lists, which I'll get to also in a second. Um, and it sort of tests which one, it, it, they're almost like mini focus groups within the people that you're going to be sending these emails to. Um, and I think it, it's, a good, it's a good tool. It may be one of those things that you sort of ease into you know, at a, at a different point, because I, I don't think it's super important. Um, but it, it does give you a better sense of what people will respond to. Um, and my last slide, I promise my last slide. Um, I, I am a big believer in some images, but less images. So you, you want to have good copy, you want to have engaging things to read. Um, I know people, you know, I, I've talked a lot about visuals. Um, this is the one place where I'd say that less visuals are, are better. Um, Another thing is lists that I just mentioned before. Lists are extremely important um, because you don't, and you, you because you want to make sure you're sending them based on what the content is. You know, an event's happening. You know, there may be specific lists that you have um, for those types of things. Um, news, another one, um, and you know, you kind of just it just depends on on the, your subscriber base and and what you've done in the past, and you can sort of um, create these lists on the, you know, as you're going along and add people uh, based on what, you know, on what they're interested in, what they've clicked on or, or um, things like that. Uh, and you want to watch your, your uh, frequency with how long, um, with, sorry, with how many times you, you send people. So I would not do more than once a week, but it also depends on what you're doing. So, that, you know, if, if, if it's different lists and you're not really, there's not a lot of overlap, it's probably fine to send more than that. Um, but two in a week is, is I think, plenty. Um, and the other thing I'll say, which is also not something that I'm a huge fan of, but 
that I have done before and has, I think, worked somewhat well is putting subscribers' names in the subject line. I, I It's, again, you can kind of take it or leave it. However, I do think it is a good way to sometimes use it sparingly. Use, use sparingly, I think, is a good way to grab people's attention. So um, with that, I will take any questions. Anybody have any thoughts or questions? I know that was a lot, so I I, I realize that. <laughs> um, in the chat, uh, we want our residents to have access to our newsletters via email. How can we set that up? Um, that's a good question. I think um, at some point maybe you had collected that information maybe they maybe they don't have an email that that's might make it a little bit more difficult um the thing i would say to that is maybe there is a way to maybe they have other relatives who i don't know what you know i i don't know the protocols um right now um with with covid and stuff uh and assorted other things that are going around but you know um getting in contact with family members is a good way to make sure that residents at least have a good chance of seeing your newsletter. Um, you can always, I mean, it's a little old fashioned, I think, but you can print it out and maybe like slip it under people's doors. I don't know. I don't know the etiquette. And maybe that's not good etiquette. I'm not sure. Um, uh, but I think there are different ways you can kind of get. And if you don't have people's email addresses already, you know, of, of residents, um, and they do, I mean, I think it's it's a fair thing. Maybe when there's an, some type of, you know, um, uh, some type of event, you can have like a sign up sheet, like, some, you know, at, at and someone stationed, you know, with a list and, and um, try to collect emails that way. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really 100% sure what, what best practices are in, in that scenario. Um, we have a, yeah, we have another chat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what um, we're actually going to have a second part of this session on newsletters. Um, but again, I think the most important thing to keep in mind, um, there is uh, issues with potentially fair housing. Management just needs to be involved with the newsletters just mm -hmm. to make sure that there's nothing um, that could be a fair housing violation or, or some other, um, something that wouldn't be good with HUD. So it would, I would not put out a newsletter without collaborating with at least management having a review of it. And that would go the same if the residents choose to do their own newsletter as well. Although I, I think it should, again, a collaboration. And do all the developments have newsletters? I think most do. Is there anybody that doesn't have a newsletter? Okay, um, we have a chat. We always do a physical newsletter and sign up sheets for events. Mm -hmm. Our supervisor always edits and okays first. Okay, that's good. Um, I was gonna say one other oh, thing, one, one thing, sorry. If, if it's just a physical newsletter and maybe you're not sending it out online, I would say some of the, like what I said about visuals might not apply. Um, I, I think it's just, it just depends on the medium. Um, oh, also online, okay. Um, yeah, then just, you can print out, like you said, um, sorry. Oh, great. Um, okay. Thank you, Alex. Now we're going to go to Amanda Spywack and Amanda, um, if you saw her, her bio, she's been with Bene Brith, I think about a year and she works with various departments, but she works with us in CSS, um, editing our our newsletter, the seniority report. And um, as things go more into in-person meetings, she's actually probably going to be assisting us more with some of our in-person meetings. Um, so you may see her at a meeting at some point, but a little fact about um, Amanda is that uh, her grandmother worked at Bene Brith for many, many years and um, her grandmother, Anne, was my first boss and hired me 30 years ago to work at Bene Brith. So um, Amanda definitely has Bene Brith in her blood, if you want to put it that way. 
Um, and so take it away, Amanda. Hi, thank you, Janelle. Um, one moment, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can everyone see it? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. I um, am the administrative associate at B'nai B'rith. I do um, editing for the Snow Report, and I also am the deputy editor for B'nai B'rith magazine. So um, hopefully I'm pretty well versed to give this presentation today, but let's make a newsletter. So what's a newsletter? Newsletter is a printed electronic report and it can come out periodically. It contains news concerning the activities of a business or organization. In this case, it's the resident housing. And it's sent out to members, customers, employees, and anyone else who's interested in what's going on in the local community. Um, questions to ask is, you know, does your building have a newsletter? Does the resident association, you know, um, do they have to be involved? Who's in charge? Who, who contributes? And how often is it gonna come out? Um, there's a lot of benefits into having a newsletter. I think it really brings the community together. It keeps people up to date. And I think it's a really great way to get people where you're living involved in what's going on. So there's some methods to putting together a newsletter. And if management already has a newsletter, are residents able to have leadership? Can they have a crucial role? Or can they just contribute? Um, if residents or the resident association wants to make a newsletter, um, is there a process for it to be approved? And like, what's the management's role? I don't exactly know the protocols for each and every building. So if you're interested, I would check with your leadership on um, what steps you would have to take to do that. Um, so let's start going over the basics. So we're gonna be focusing on audience, purpose, frequency, choosing topics, proofreading, content, and roles that are in, the news, in a newsletter. So audience, purpose, and frequency. Your audience are who you're writing for. In this case, it would probably be the residents, um, the staff, anyone that's involved in your local community. Um, remember that newsletters are you know, for your community, stuff like that. And then if you're not sure what your audience want, you can survey, you can make a poll of potential stories that you wanna put out, or you can just talk to your fellow residents about things that they're interested in and maybe you'll get inspiration from that. Um, and you can also decide for frequency. So it could be weekly, monthly, or quarterly. The senior report comes out quarterly, so it comes out four times a year. But if you um, are really involved or there's a lot of things going on, it could come out more than once, um, more monthly and more weekly, but it shouldn't come out more than that. Topic ideas. So for content, it should be based on the community and the resident housing that you're in. So some ideas you can come up with are staff or resident profiles, upcoming events happening, announcements from management. Um, you could look at local news or local culture events and see if there's anything happening nearby that you would like to cover, resident council messages, um, recipes, calendars. You could even take crossword puzzles. It could really be a great collection of different topics, which can make it very interesting for the readers. Um, when thinking about content, just remember there is privacy. So, you know, check with your community regulations about people's personal information. And also remember to ask people their consent about their birthdays or where they live, um, just to make sure everything is okayed and safe. And if you're ever covering something um, or doing research, remember to credit your sources. It is a very uh, important journalistic principle. So don't remember it. So remember to do that. And then if you like for any free things to add in, there's plenty of websites that have free photos, free jokes, free quotes, um, a lot of things you can edit, um, put in that aren't necessarily have to be copyrighted. So let's go into the positions that happen in the newsletter. We're gonna be covering editor, writer, producer, and proofreader. So the editor, their responsibilities, and what I do for my newsletter is um, we plan the content of the newsletter. So who is a birthday this month? who are reprofiling, are there any current events? Um, they can be a writer for the newsletter um, and they look at all the stories, they read it and they edit on it and they make sure that everything is polished and the copy is clean and keeps track and make sure that all the um, articles and content coming in are free of errors and is kind of the last eyes on the content coming in. So 
they're really the final people that are gonna make sure that it's okay and clean and ready for publishing. Um, a writer, there can be multiple writers. Um, a writer obviously writes the content. You can come up with stories, um, features, and you can also really put a lot of creativity into this position. Um, you can have one writer, a lot of other people that may do other positions in the newsletter can also be writers. Um, with the newsletter and the magazine, there's about four to five writers each. So definitely a very fun position. And then the producer of a newsletter, it can kind of be, it doesn't have to be like one producer, but um, it's good to have someone that kind of takes charge about deadlines and make sure that kind of the small things like photos, calendars, and design outlines are in check. Someone who's a little bit more tech savvy. Resources for layouts that I would recommend would be Microsoft Word and Microsoft Publisher. There's some templates on there for newsletters and brochures that might help you plan out how you want it to look. Um, and then finally, I think my the most important one is proofreaders. Um, everyone in the newsletter can do this, or you could have a designated person. When you're writing and you're looking at your content over and over again, it is really hard to point out mistakes because you're so used to what you've written. It's always great to get a fresh pair of eyes on it. Um, a really good system that I like is the circle method. So you just pass it around. Everyone takes turns reviewing each other's work. And that way everyone can kind of have different edits and you get mostly the cleanest copy you're gonna get from having multiple people out look it over. Um, something to always uh, review is commonly confused words. Um, I think for no matter your age, you're gonna mess up on grammar. So always just take a good review on these. I was gonna go through them, but I decided against it. I think most people here know, but definitely good to re refresh on your uh, grammar and confused words because those are just commonly always getting messed up. Um, when it comes to design, you wanna try to make it simple and clean. If you have too many photos or if things are not looking like fluid or in order, it can really make it hard for the reader to follow what's going on. Um, an example, if you're curious, could be the senior report, for example, um, if you wanna see how things are designed. Um, you might wanna only use three fonts when writing. So you wanna have your headline, a body for text, and then you might wanna use bolded or italics for special things or like if you're using a title, something like that. And then um, moving on, distribution. So I know we were talking about this earlier with the questions. So for printed, I think there's multiple different options, especially within the housing residents because you have access to your audience firsthand. So you could print or make a hard copy. You can mail it out to each resident. Um, hand it out or even set up a stand for people to grab it casually in a lobby. Um, online, I would recommend turning it into a PDF. Um, you can ask for people that want to be subscribed for their emails or even um, advertise it on Facebook if you have a Facebook group and have the link that way. So those are some really um, easy ways to distribute the newsletter. And in conclusion, um, so that's kind of all it is for me and the basics of a newsletter. So sign up to receive this, this in your report. It will be my last push for, for that. But if you would like to email me at aspywack at theneighbors.org, um, if you make a newsletter, I would love to read it. And if you have any questions or want any help, like feel free to reach out to me. Uh, the question I have is that with a newsletter, do you find it, potentially creating more problems with the families of of residents rather than the residents because of, uh, their increased focus on things that you put you're putting out there as far as it's concerned anybody have something they want to say about that i don't personally write for um, a housing newsletter so if someone has experience with that um I would love to hear from them. So does anyone that, that does the newsletter for your property have issues with anything you've put in there that, oh yeah, somebody said, what was the question? Okay, so the question was, with your building newsletter, has it um, opened up complaints maybe um, 
with something you've put in there from maybe family members, if they see it, or residents even? Or is everybody, their newsletters are well received? I think something really important is to remember when covering people or having um, something related to, you know, your newsletter that has your housing. Um, it's about your residency. Just check with management and it's always good to have, you know, extra opinions if something is okay and something may seem inappropriate because people do have different opinions. And I think the more people that you have reviewing it, the more you'll be able to have those discussions. Right. So, so I don't I don't know if it's the same way all around, but you know, our service coordinator pretty much does the newsletter and it's it's brought positive, nothing but positive things. I mean, even family who looks at it, they look positively at the Covenant House because the newsletter says so much and is so well done. And um, we just had a few people put in chat that they um, have been requested not to put birthdays in actually by the residents. And I think Amanda covered that too, that, you know, before you put things like that in, you, you do need to check with the residents. I know some buildings have a policy that they don't put birthdays on there. They just say if somebody's, it's their birthday month. Um, a lot of people are saying their residents look forward to the newsletter. Um, let's see. Um, our newsletter is done cooperatively with marketing and service coordinator. If you have marketing, um, let's see. Uh, Jesse mentioned that with their building, uh, the residents complained there were too many newsletters. Uh, they were receiving way too many, so they cut it down and they just do it monthly. And I think most buildings, that's what you do is monthly newsletters. And generally it has um, might have something from management, might have something from the service coordinators, um, has the, the uh, calendar for the month. Um, and um, Peggy from the Bronx, she's the service coordinator there, said um, the residents look forward to the newsletters and she checks with management if she's going to add something new. Um, so something I know a few buildings have done in the past, I haven't seen as many newsletters because I think a lot of them are just emailed now or just handed out in the building and not mailed. Um, having a residence corner, allowing them maybe to submit some something to the newsletter as well might be a way to get them engaged. Um, so, but then again, you do need to, um, you know, review anything that goes in the newsletter. And we had one comment about topics. Um, you know, you can, anything informational, and even if it's about religion, you know, this month we're ce we're celebrating Passover, we're celebrating Easter, that's okay. But um, you do want to avoid getting uh, too religious about it. And uh, I think um, that, if that makes sense, it's more informational if you want to put in things like that, and it's perfectly fine. Um, so again, management should be reviewing anything and usually they have a policy even if it's a flyer that the resident association puts out it should be reviewed by management because they are well versed in fair housing um, and how some of these things can be perceived i have not seen an um a newsletter that that in any any time that had anything that was really controversial because management's involved with it um okay so we have a comment some residents complain that a text box background excuse me, a text box background is too dark sometimes. It makes it difficult to read. So periodically, just um, if you print it out, there may be things that um, if you're having a little trouble reading, uh, people with some vision issues um, certainly may have trouble reading. And along with that, I'm using different fonts like curly fonts or very fancy Gothic fonts. You can't read them or different colored ink. So, you know, kind of sticking to basics. Yeah, and I know people that, um, you know, there's plenty of people that maybe have uh, lower vision than they used to, macular degeneration, a lot of things like that can make it difficult to read. So larger fonts, I know with um, the resident leadership retreat, we have revised it a lot to try to make sure everything's in an easy to read larger font. It just makes it so much easier. 
A tip that I would recommend is if you're using a dark background, use then like a white text. And if you're using dark text, use a white background. So that way the text is very legible to read. And also if you're using a lot of um, dark, dark backgrounds, if you're copying it, <laughs> it actually takes more ink to print that out too. <laughs> It'll probably take longer. Um, does anybody have, we're running a little late. Does anybody have any other um, questions or um, suggestions, comments? Okay, so let's see. We also have a management section where the property manager has a say or adds a section of the lease to remind residents of any violations, et cetera, as well as our maintenance department has a section. And I think that's, I've seen a few newsletters that have maintenance um, making some comments, um, you know, if there's something going on, people are putting the wrong trash or the wrong things in recycling, a lot of things like that. It, it's informational and it's a great way to get people to um, pay attention instead of just telling them um, to the wider audience. So um, I think this will be an upcoming topic. Maybe we'll explore more in some of our in-person meetings where we'll have more time. So um, with that, I want to thank Amanda and Alex for taking time out of their work days to be with us today. And um, thank you, you all. <laughs> Have a great rest of the day. And again, it clearly this is a topic that um, we're going to expand on and have more discussions because it, it's very timely and obviously uh, a good topic. Okay, thank you.